Good evening. Welcome to another discussion program on tackling youth crime post COVID-19. RAM, Renew the African Mindset, is actually an open forum where we talk about topical issues uh, prevalent within the um, African and Afro-Caribbean uh, communities. We focus on issues which affect us with the platform to share experiences, views, and ideas is also a platform where we seek to positively influence the way of thinking and appreciation of fundamental factors which actually affects the mindset. Also, we discuss a variety of topics here and uh, which in within the African societies or within the Afro-Caribbean communities is deemed to be um, taboo subjects. So, for example, we're talking about tackling uh, youth crime today. There is always a culture of silence amongst the youths. So thereby, some people actually escape prosecutions. So today we're going to delve into uh, this um, topic. How do we prevent uh, young adults from going into crime and those who are already there? What can we do? to engage them positively so that they don't, don't go back reoffending. So with me today, I have some panelists who are going to uh, share with us today what's, you know, using their own experience as well to tell us about how to tackle um, the uh, violence surrounding young adults. Another aspect of it is that now we are having the lockdown restrictions worldwide. Some people have reported that there have been very low increase in incident rates of crime being committed by young adults. Is it because of the fact that we have the lockdown restrictions or is it because some of the cases are not being reported? Whatever it is, we need to uh, put in uh, measures in place post COVID-19 in the UK. The restrictions are going to be lifted on the 15th of June. In other parts of the world, it's already been you know, lifted slowly. So what can we do to encourage our youths and you know, to ensure that they are not leading uh, the path of um, crime? So with me today, um, we're going to start off the discussion by bringing a gentleman uh, who was actually um, a superintendent with the Metropolitan Police Service. He served there for 30 years with wide ranging operational and strategic experience. He was a founding member and former chair of both the Metropolitan and National Black Police Association. As a past member of the Stephen Lawrence Terrain Group, his contribution to diversity in policy has been extensive, which included work on home office, in setting the first national police recruitment, retention and progression targets for minority ethnic officers. He's a seasoned speaker on a range of social political issue, addressing inequalities and injustices. He was awarded the MBA, that is member of the British Empire, honorary doctorate, in addition to numerous commissioner's commendations during his metropolitan service career. Join me in welcoming Mr. Leroy Logan, MBE. Good afternoon, Mr. Lo uh, Mr. Logan. Good afternoon, Anne. Hopefully you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah, we're in very challenging times, so yeah. um, there's a lot to discuss. And I'll just go into um, a very brief um, outline, of because yes. we're talking about youth crime post-COVID, because we're still not sure when post-COVID will occur because of the fact that we don't have a vaccine or any antiviral um, medication. So we, we're still in this transition process, but I think the best thing we have to be prepared as to what is ahead of us. Yeah. And I welcome this opportunity to, to speak with you all so that at least we can have um, a consensus and how attitude and what we should have in mind as we move into a post-COVID era. Um, I just want to um, outline what are the sort of risk factors mm -hmm. for um, young people in particular right. who are involved in knife and gun crime. Right. 
it is um, obviously um, factors that young people, especially in urban settings, um, it, not so much in rural areas, but in urban settings, you have uh, dysfunctional families and um, a lack of hope and aspirations within the home. Uh, they do say that, you know, in um, fixing the home, you can fix a lot of societal ills. And, and so fixing the home, especially in this um, lockdown um, era in which we're all in, is yeah. extremely valid because there has been an increase in domestic violence, um, certain types of uh, abuses and online grooming. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll hopefully will see from my first slide how the dysfunctional issues around the home and aspirations and those what I call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. I'm sure a lot of you are acquainted with that, mm -hmm. where it's, um, it, I will go into a bit more detail um, about that, but if you can go back to that first slide, please. Um, um, also, we, we have to highlight, especially in what's happening in the COVID time, is trauma and other mental health factors. Um, I think that's really um, the hidden iceberg. We only see in the tip of the iceberg above the surface, but we, there is um, all sorts of evidence to suggest that um, people are traumatized in the home. And of course, we're going to have a certain amount of mental health um, factor, um, increasing in mental health issues. And also some of them are um, drug-induced, drug-induced psychosis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and especially if you're living in a crime infested area, it can fuel your um, tendency to be at risk. And uh, as I said before, these urban deprived um, areas can be a factor. One of the other issues is around school exclusions. It is quite clear that um, all the evidence proves that if you're excluded from school, whether it's permanent or temporary, you're four to five um, times more likely to be involved in crime. Sometimes they actually say, in being excluded, you might as well write the, the date and time when that individual is gonna enter the penal system and, and, and be incarcerated. Also, um, as I touched on before, drug and alcohol abuse in the home and on the streets. And, as, and so, you know, th there could be a spilling out, especially if, um, as we're going to the summer, um, a lot of people call it the silly season when people do the most outrageous um, issues because they get restless, especially been locked in for so many months. And now they're going to be um, less restricted and they're going to be a lot more free. And they could get into negative peer groups and all sorts of um, bad behavior because of peer to peer um, influence. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Yeah, so I was talking about ACEs, um, adverse child experiences. So you can see there's um, the psychological abuse, especially online psychological abuse um, in the home. Um, if there's um, physical as well as psych uh, psychological abuse, there's sexual abuse behind the home, um, emotional neglect, um, as well as physical neglect. Um, the loss of a parent for any reason. So, if, you know, if the family has lost a parent or another adult in the home through COVID-19, it can have a massive impact on them. Um, as I said, domestic violence, the mother invariably get being um, ill-treated and or treated violently, and then substance abuse, you know, um, solvent abuse, that's, um, and also um, taking certain controlled drugs. I've already touched on the mental illness in the family, especially if people are going through a crisis and of course, criminal behavior in the household. Mm -hmm. So all these COVID factors are exacerbated and, mm -hmm. and the ACEs is significantly enhanced. And, and just my last slide. Okay. So here we have um, the crime stats. So this is 2018-19. So the crime figures 
are not as in depth as I would like them because there's under reporting um, at the present time um, within the home. So we up to um, the end of last year, there was a 13.8% increase in violent crime. Now that's a year on year increase. It's been going on that up, upward trend since 2011. So we're talking about 96 crimes per thousand people, which is um, significantly high. It also has 122 homicides um, and one of the worst years in London. And there's nothing to suggest that's um, reducing. You might not be seeing so much on the, on, in the press, but um, I get direct feeds and the number of homicides, killings, uh, especially with knife crime, that's going up to 15,000 offenses and that's been that level for some years now there, 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 there is nothing really changed you're not might, you might not see the publicity because everything's on covid but mm -hmm. those crimes are still being committed and a lot of them are around um county lines cross-border drug um supply going into rural areas um not so much using the public transport because of the restriction but they're using private cars and even motorbikes um, acid attacks, um, again, on a similar level, but, you know, not as bad as um, it has been in the past. And as, as I had already talked about, the school exclusions, 5.8 increase in school exclusions. And I think that this just sets the, the, the atmosphere and the, the back, backdrop in which we should have our discussions. And hopefully... It's clear, if you have any questions, I'm quite happy to assist at a later date. And over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Logan. And just for everybody to know, um, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat box. Um, once we finish this session, which is actually informative, uh, we get to the interactive session, which is your question and answer period, then we'll take all the questions there. So if you have any questions for Mr. Logan, just make sure that you have them set aside. Thank you. So the next person we're going to call, oh, no, Mr. Logan, I have a couple of questions for you here. How would you define youth crime? Youth crime is quite a, a generalized term, really. Um, it's, it's invariably... Um, by the definition of, of, of the Child Care Act, anyone under 25. But there's, there's a specific um, focus on teenagers. So crime involving teenagers, whether they're a victim or they're actually um, um, a suspect invariably um, as, a, as the victim mm -hmm. specifically. And especially if there's multiple victims, we, we find that young people um, can be at risk. So as a result of that, there is definitely um, a focus on teenagers. Mm -hmm. So crimes involving youngsters and specific issue is around the knife being the weapon of choice mm -hmm. um, for teenagers, especially since there's more higher penalties for gun crime or possession of firearms. So as a result of that, you're talking about teenagers invariably committing crimes with the knife as a weapon of choice. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's involving gangs or criminal activity. Uh, it might be just um, committing offenses amongst themselves. And of course, it could lead to life changing injuries or death. Okay. During your 30 years experience with the uh, MPS, that is the Metropolitan uh, Service, how, how do you perceive youth crime now, particularly during this pandemic? Well, I think it's a real issue because since 2010, mm. the, the Met has been subject to austerity. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the biggest, um, I'll say, recession factors was the reduction of community cops. And community cops were a, a very important interface between the police and young people. They, they would be, those community cops, because when I was superintendent at Hackney, I had um, over 250 officers involved in safer neighborhood teams and various other interventions with young people. And those prevention programs were key in one, preventing crime or repeat offending, but also to maintain good dialogue and good 
um, mutual conversations and create and, and, and invariably the officers had an acknowledgement of what the young people going through through um, community hubs and youth hubs. So it was very, very active, very dynamic. But as the recession went on, less and less cops. So when I used to have one sergeant, two constables and three community support officers on a safer neighbor team ward, now those um, wards may have two constables, no sergeant, no PCSOs, and those officers might be covering more than one ward. Mm -hmm. So it can have some massive, massive impact on that interface. And the officers are not ring fenced that ward. They now have to go and police on other wards or outside the borough. So that has been the, the austerity um, recession um, yeah. cannot be underestimated. And there was a Home Affairs Select Committee um, report that showed last year that um, if officers do not connect with young people, mm -hmm. there is um, a disconnect and, office, uh, and young people don't connect with officers. They won't report crime. Uh, they won't give information, intelligence. And so the officers will not have the, the real clarity of what's happening on the ground. You know, be walking around blind to, to some extent. But in closing, um, I've been running a, a youth um, charity called Void Youth. Mm -hmm. um, it really is um, a, a, temp, a, a litmus test of what's going on in the street. Mm -hmm. And there's never been a year where those young people don't complain that the heavy handed policing has an effect on their trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. And the legitimacy of uh, the, sorry, the cornerstone of police legitimacy is trust and confidence, especially yeah. with young people. Yeah. And those officers, uh, sorry, those young people always say the officers are very hard on them, show them, show a lack of respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the um, young people feel they're over policed and unprotected. So if you if they don't think police can make them feel safe and secure, then they're going to negative peer groups that can end up in them going to the street justice instead of the justice system. Right. So what do you think is the cause of youth crime, particularly within the BAME communities? Well, you know, I'm a great believer of crime is crime. Crime has no color. There's some, certain social political factors. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that 80% um, of BAME communities live mm -hmm. in the, the most um, deprived boroughs. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, with that, there's less likely to have um, good education mm -hmm. and more than likely to be excluded from school. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of this is through the institutional racism of within schools, as well as with the police. Mm -hmm. And the police can reinforce the exclusions if, again, they're showing those systemic failures of mm -hmm. institutional racism. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, you, you've got to understand that the, the, the systems are, are, are not giving the young people options. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they don't have a sound education, they've got less, of, <coughs> excuse me, less options of, you know, getting out of that um, deprivation and they're easily groomed into committing crimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th these are social political issues, economic issues, not the fact that because they're black, they commit mm -hmm. crime. You know, that's that. And then, you know, if, if police have um, stereotypical um, and, and make assumptions about young people, then they can actually add fuel to the fire. And I'll give you an example in closing. There is this thing called the gangs matrix. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be an assessment of risk, um, assessing young people. And it's supposed to be protective so they prevent harm. Well, unfortunately, how it's been used um, adversely and in an institutionalist way, institutionally racist way, they have made assumptions based on a flawed criminal intelligence system, and then they have gone on to criminalize young people who shouldn't be on the, the gangs matrix, because one, they're not involved in a gang, they haven't committed um, an offense involving gangs. The only things they might be, because they come from a deprived area where, where crime um, is a factor, um, it might be a crime hotspot and they might have someone that they went to school with or they played in the same sports team or whatever it may be. And as a result of that, they can be associated even before they even realize. And of course, 
once you're on the matrix and there's no challenge to get off, there is this real issue about being criminalized through an institutional racist tool. Hmm. Indeed. Well, that's from the uh, UK perspective. I'm now going to call on the next panelist who is going to share with us what goes on in Nigeria. So the next guest is an assistant commissioner of police, uh, ACP Monde Agbonica. He's a seasoned police officer with 28 years experience, which spans investigation, operations, and community policing. After serving in Lagos State for several years, he is now the area commander in Ota, Ogun State, Nigeria. Um, he has been involved in dealing with cultism related crimes in various parts of northern and southern part of Nigeria. He has been involved in several police reform efforts, including youth and school outreach programs. One, he's, he was also one of the three finalists for the first ever Citizens Day Lagos Award for exemplary conduct in 2015. Welcome to the program, ACP Agbonica, the Assistant ah, Commissioner of Police, Monde Agbonica. Welcome. Thank you. Right. Uh, you heard from um, Mr. Logan. He's actually a retired uh, uh, superintendent of the Metropolitan Police Force in the United Kingdom. You are uh, in Nigeria there. And I want to put a focus on courtism. Uh, Mr. Logan actually uh, said that some of the uh, reasons why this happens, the youth crime is committed by people from deprived areas. However, what we notice in Nigeria is that courtism is actually prevalent in universities in Nigeria. And these students are usually um, youths from middle class to upper class homes in Nigeria. So I have some questions here for you, uh, which I think you might be able to shed some light on the reasons why uh, there is increase in youth crime and how we can, what we can do to tackle youth crime. So how are youth crimes handled by the police in Nigeria? Well, I, I uh, want to give a little uh, brief on uh, the Nigerian situation, especially when it comes to courtism. Yes. Uh, the uh, courtism in Nigeria has been evolving over the years. Initially, we had uh, just the association, national association of sea dogs, or what they call the pirates of fraternity in universities. As you know, it was uh, started by Wole Shorinka. Uh, sometime uh, uh, during this time. And uh, then when it was founded uh, in 1952 or so, they had just seven students. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had noble objectives then. It was peaceful, non-violent, they fought against social ills, focused on humanitarian services. Pirates mm -hmm. were forced uh, in the 80s to become characterized by violence and other bizarre uh, activities. I, I talk about um, this high risk confraternity because it appears to be how the other organizations evolved in the universities. And that is how they eventually they started with the noble cause and eventually they now got hijacked by some, uh, uh, for other purposes. But uh, incidentally, uh, interestingly, what I want you to note now that is that in Nigeria, mm -hmm. the issue of cultism is not restricted to universities anymore. Hmm. Now, these officers are having a big time. When it was just universities, we thought we had a problem at our hands, but it was even better. Now, courtism has moved out of universities in Nigeria. We have youths engaged in the same courts. If I have time to list all those names that you know, Black Arts, a year for fraternity, and so on, they are all out on the streets now. And we have courtism even in high schools, what you call high schools out there, secondary schools here, you have uh, uh, courtism even in primary schools. Wow. So it's, it's now become more difficult. So they are on the streets, they are in their homes, the little two innocent children are drawn into this. And of course, from what uh, uh, my colleague from uh, uh, the UK uh, spoke about, you, we have similar situations in being drawn into crime by youths. Mm. Sometimes, I can't uh, help but uh, see youths as victims themselves. 
is because at the end of the day, the youths are branded, they are stereotyped to say this uh, person is, is criminal because they have such record and so, and so on and so forth. I was a divisional police officer in um, a busy uh, area, you know, Lagos Island, Adeniji Adele. I was a DPO there, a divisional police officer in charge of a uh, particular police formation there for over three years. And I dealt with these uh, hard uh, issues of autism uh, extensively. And I discovered that the youths there were more like victims themselves. One, they had issue of environment. The, a typical child growing up in Lagos Island does not have enough room to operate. The houses there are all overpopulated. You find a family of 10 or more living in a very small house and the child uh, most times finds himself on the streets. Uh, that is the only place he can relax if a child smokes cigarette. I mean, if uh, a young man smokes cigarette, also he has to do it on the streets. And of course, we have Ikoi and other areas, the Haibo areas and so on. The same kind, the same youths are involved in all these courtism and so on, but they are not, you won't see them on the streets as such because they have bigger houses, they, they you know, they have um, uh, swimming pools, they have uh, places where they can move around. They even take uh, drugs in these premises and they are not noticed. But these ones in this low uh, income area or highly populated or uh, peculiar kinds of uh, settlements, are branded as more criminal uh, than the other areas. Uh, it's strongly so. So uh, the issue of courtism and um, crime in Nigeria has uh, uh, taken that uh, 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 that form now. There are lots of things that are common with um, uh, the UK. Uh, so like why do you why do you think there is an increase in crimes, though? Because if I could recall, uh, once we're talking about cultism, we'll refer to the university students. But now you're telling me that even primary school uh, pupils are engaged, secondary school students as well. So why the sudden increase? Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's a kind of youth culture, uh, youth gang culture. And of course it happens everywhere. You find a child is being bullied yeah. and, and before he knows it, he, he, has, um, he feels that he needs to defend himself. Yeah. And the only options that are left for him is to belong to one of these groups. Yeah. And before he knows it, he has, he has been, um, you know, they have their induction, they have um, all kinds of uh, ceremonies, uh, you know, they take oaths and so on. <laughs> They, they, they swear to, so, you, and they do a lot of things that are not open and they are also exposed to drugs. And before they know it, they are far drawn into it. And of course, they, they become, so this is part of what uh, they say. But if you look at it generally, in terms of fossils uh, in, uh, in the area, you'll find that uh, poor parental background uh, contributes mm -hmm. to crime. But like you said, even the children of the, of, of uh, those that are, uh, uh, but then it, it doesn't matter if the parents are uh, well to do or they belong to a high or middle class, does not uh, tell on the kind of upbringing that they give to the child. So if the child is not brought up well, so because a typical Nigerian child that comes up with the local values is not uh, likely, and even we have studies that can show that it's not likely to. Uh, be drawn into uh, courtism, despite the high peer pressure that you might be exposed to. Then, of course, societal the decadence, the whole society itself, values are changed. You, when you talk about courtism, it's not only in, in, the, in the youth. We have adults that are into courtism, and some of them are well, and they have advantage in society, they have political advantage, they have lots of this is, this is what the, the youth are also looking up to. They are like a small or rather a kind of uh, young sect of this, this, uh, uh, this adult. So the society itself and the values that are, of course, you know about corruption, you know things that are uh, 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 sort of um, uh, praised and, uh, in, in Nigeria that shouldn't be. And, and of course, this encourages then erosion of educational standards 
the standard of education, the education should have, uh, should in, uh, include um, uh, moral is, uh, uh, upbringing. They should include a system that would bring up the child in, uh, or rather the young man or uh, youths, uh, give them values yeah. that they, they should uh, fight for. But you know, the standard is, because you find that the educationists themselves are not well motivated so they are interested in other businesses that uh, help them to meet their bills and so on. It's not like it used to be those days. So all these are contributing. Of course, the Nigerian youths are also militarized, militarized because if you discover the kind of politics that has, that has evolved over the years right. in this country, mm -hmm. you find that politicians have recruit youths, give them, arm them with guns and so on. And uh, they use them as political talks, you know, to achieve um, uh, whatever, because it helps, they, f they feel that it, it helps them in their political. So youth are militarized. They, they have, they, are, they don't have just only knives like it used to be. Uh, now they have access to guns, they have uh, other still drugs and they have money and, and so on. Of course, the, the quest for social identity, power and protection, I mentioned that earlier. If a child feels it's being uh, bullied, he might want to have some kind of power and edge over his destiny. And of course, you have revenge, mm -hmm. the, especially on Lagos Island, where I worked extensively. Revenge used to be a, a very big role. Sometimes you, you hear that a, a young man from or a youth from one street have been attacked. And so the, that street, the youth from that street want to go back, go to the street uh, from where the, or where the attackers came from and so on, and to hit back. So you find that kind of gang culture uh, uh, encourages this um, uh, belonging to uh, courts and so on. Then, or they might say someone from one court has attacked someone from the other court. And so the courts, if they are not able to hit back, it means they are uh, rated lower uh, mm -hmm. and so on, of course. And peer pressure yeah. and uh, uh, political trouble that I mentioned. Yeah, you've worked in three states, uh, Kano, Ogun, and Lagos State. Um, how do you handle the crimes? Are they are they dealt with in the same area, or I mean, in the same way, or um, is it general, like we have in the UK here? Whether you you live in the northern part of England or in London or whatever it is, it's still dealt the same way. So how is it dealt with in Nigeria? Youth crimes. How do the police handle the youth crimes in all the states? Do they differ? Yes, you, you have differences in the way you handle the youth, youth crimes because the crimes themselves that are prevalent in different parts of the country are different. Mm -hmm. But you, there are similarities like the, the courts, the kinds of courts that exist in the north, especially the ones that exist on the streets are different from the normal courts that exist in the universities. But those courts that exist in northern universities are similar to those that exist in southern universities. So mm -hmm. there are it depends on the problem you come across. Any police officer will tell you that the way he uh, handles a particular situation depends on, and there are exact, it's very difficult to have two exact situations. For a, a police officer will tell you that. Two, no, I'm not every, talking about the exact situation. I'm talking about the different states. Do you yes, disagree? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm still getting there. You see, like um, in the north, they have uh, predominantly Islam-based uh, communities. Right. The, the ways they handle their cases are different. Like if you want to go and make an arrest for youth in their um, houses, some of the houses are, are called, they, they say they are in order, the women are in order. So they, you have to respect their uh, religious beliefs. You can't just walk into the house and say you want to pick up a child. You have to follow some procedures. You need to get there, for instance, and tell them that the women should go to one side. You have a warrant to go into these premises. And, uh, you know, if you don't do that, they, it can lead to some kind of religious opera that will be more uh, than what you are trying to solve by trying to bring this uh, uh, young ones to other. You see? So in the, and you also find that the kinds of drugs that are um, patronized, in the north are a bit different from the group of drugs that are patronized in the south. For instance, the uh, tremadol or what uh, these um, uh, drugs tremadol. that are psychoactive drugs yeah. that are used extensively in the north. And you also have these um, uh, 
uh, benzene, these uh, codeine uh, uh, kind of drugs are more uh, patronized than the North. You find, right. uh, especially women and um, uh, offenders are likely to use those kind of drugs more than uh, this. And of course, are marijuana and so on. But marijuana is also used uh, extensively in the South. And of course, you have more other drugs like uh, uh, cocaine and um, heroin and so on in right. the South. So this, you find little differences in how uh, these kids are handled. And of course, like night life, the, the kind of uh, club life is more in the South than, than in the North. So you a little difference in uh, uh, the way you handle But generally, you, the, the cases are the same. And of course, the laws. The law that operates in the South is the criminal code which is different from what operates in the North. The penal code operates in the North. So it's, and because the laws are different, of course the, the criminal procedures are also different, but the North is different from the, from the South. So these are the differences we encounter between the two okay. regions. Thank you so much for that, ACP Evonica, uh, for such an insightful contribution. Many thanks. Uh, the next person that will speak to join in on the conversation, um, she is a representative of the Nigerian Prosecution Service. Um, we need to find out, we're talking about youth crime now. Um, she's actually based in Lagos State. And um, but, ACP Agbonica has mentioned a bit about uh, the way cases are being dealt with in the northern part of Nigeria, as well as other states. So she, from her uh, own perspective, I don't know whether she might be able to give us information regarding other states. But then again, just to let everybody know um, that she's actually representing Lagos State. She is the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions in Lagos State Ministry of Justice. She's a member of the Federation Association of International Women Lawyers and the Nigerian Bar Association. She has attended several international legal conferences. She has been involved in criminal prosecutions for nearly two decades. Welcome, Adetutu Oshinuse. Adetutu Oshinuse, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, welcome yes. to Renew the African Mindset. Yes, thank you very much. Good right. evening, everybody. It's I nice to be a question for you here. You yes. represent uh, Lagos State. You heard what um, ACP Agbonica said, that there are two different laws, you know, the northern part of Nigeria and the southern. Um, yes. Does that apply to prosecutions as well? Well, yeah, it, in Lagos State, in Lagos State particularly, we have just one um, law that um, um, that um, that is, um, the criminal prosecution comes under, yeah. and particularly as regards um, children or juvenile offenders, there is another law which is the child rights law. Right. In Lagos State. Right. Um, there are there are the, the regular courts mm -hmm. where the normal civil um, the normal criminal prosecution law mm -hmm. um, applies, right. and at the juvenile courts or the child's um, the uh, it's called the family court. Mm -hmm. The family courts that's where children or child offender is right. taken to, where he's indicted for. An offense. Right. So at those um, family courts, the child's rights law applies. Right. So it's more like two different laws or rules that apply as well. Okay. But it is not. It does not relate to religion or whatever. Okay. What's the yeah. definition of a young person under the Nigerian law? Well. In Nigeria, there is no specific de de uh, definition of a young person. The law, which is the Child's Rights Act, mm -hmm. that's the federal legislation, and also the, the, the legal state law, the Child's Rights Law, they both define a child. They, both laws do not define uh, young offenders or whatever. Child, defines a child. And this definition or this interpretation is that uh, uh, an offender 
or a child that is under the age of 18. Right. Under the age of 18, specifically. Okay. okay. All right. Um, how are cases of youth crimes handled when the police pass on cases to your department? How are they handled? Well, the, 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 the case files, particularly, <laughs> they are brought to our office by the police. Because once there, there is, once an offense has been committed, yeah. the, the, the victim or the complainant re, reports to the police. Mm -hmm. the, 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 yes, and the police gets the offender arrested one way or the other, takes statements from him or her, mm -hmm. then they bring the, the, the fight case file to our office. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't get to us. It might stay at the magistrate court level. Right. But um, when the matter, when the offense is a grievous offense, like where a child goes to rob or where a child goes to get himself engaged in murder, manslaughter, mm -hmm. such files have to come to our office. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets to us, we sit down, we look at it, mm -hmm. and um, we consider whether the child has actually committed the offense. Mm -hmm. Where it's something that can be resolved yeah. amicably, the matter might be re referred to the mediation or citizen's right department, yeah. Yeah. or if it's a child that has repeatedly yeah. committed an offense, right. that child will be indicted and will be asked to be tried at the family court, yeah. family court, not at the regular court. Okay. I want to uh, actually go, uh, you know, ramming on something you just said there, that if um, you can, you know, that uh, if your department can come to some sort of solution, we know without a shadow of doubt things that are, do actually go on. And from a cultural perspective, say it's uh, to do with a university student that was involved in courtism. And of course, we're talking about the child of a high profile individual in the society. How would you deal with such a case? Well, that first and foremost, we have to determine the age of that offender. Right. Yes, because before a matter can be regarded as, well, I would say such offense as, like a cultism, as right. far as I'm concerned, it's no longer a youth's crime. Right. It's committed by an adult. So we we'll right. first of all, first of all, have to determine the age of yeah. the offender. Right. If the offender is under the age of 18, right. then he remains a child yeah. under the law. Okay, let me create and, a scenario for you. The, yes. the, this person is not a child. It's clear cut that the person committed the crime. Maybe yeah. he killed someone. And yes. this is a child of a high profile individual in Nigeria. How are you going to handle such a case? Are you yes. going to be the, 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 the matter will be will be considered the, the legal advice will be will be will come up with the legal advice on that. That's the first thing. Then after the legal advice will advise the police that the state is going to prosecute this person for this offense. Right. And um, an information is filed at the I court, which is right. the regular court. Right. It doesn't go to the Yeah, I, I think court. maybe I should just make it very clear. What I was trying to say here is in the United Kingdom here, nobody is above the law. Yeah. If you commit a crime, you serve the time. So I'm just trying to find out, does uh, you know the same statement apply in Nigeria? Yes, it does. It does. That's what I'm saying. It okay. does. All right. It applies. Okay. No one is above the law. Once an offense is committed, they, they, you, you, get, um, you get prosecuted for it. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much for that. We'll hold it in the interim there. Um, as we've always said, in RAM here, we share positive stories as well. Um, part of what RAM stands for is to you know, promote success stories and how people have overcome their challenges and now become a source of inspiration to others. Um, 
With us today, we have someone who was once involved in youth crime. He's briefly going to share with us his life, which is titled From Detention to Extinction. This uh, guest here we have with us today is a UK-based global leadership speaker and trainer. He delivers youth leadership uh, programs to educational institutions and prisons, youth groups, religious organizations across the UK and around the world. He's an author of two books, including his latest entitled, The Doorway to the Extension. Welcome, Oni Ayado. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, uh, my name is Oni, Oni Ayado. I'm a UK-based global leadership speaker. So my life story, my legacy is titled From Detention to Distinction. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Hackney, East London. For our international guests, London's divided into four areas, mm -hmm. North London, South London, West London, and East London. So born and raised to a 2.4 family. Um, unfortunately, at a very early age, my dad left. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, I think when me and my sister were six or seven or seven or eight. Mm -hmm. So for the majority of my childhood years and my teenage years, it was just me and my mum and my sister. Thankfully, on Father's Day, about eight years ago, me and my father reunited after 25 plus years. Mm. Unbelievably emotional time. So coming from a Nigerian background, my mum being the best mum in the world, I went through a good education education system, secondary mm. school, college, university. Um, university was a real awakening for me. I mean, growing up in Hackney, all my friends were black, but going to university, I had a mixed culture of friends, Chinese, Indian, et cetera, et cetera. So I went through the education system. Unfortunately, when I got to the second year of university, I dropped out of university. I was the only one out of my friends at university and began living a particular life called the street life. I mean, in London, in Nigeria, they might call it area boys, but in London, they call it the street life. It wasn't really gangs at the time, but it was just young men on the streets of East London up to no good. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in that period, six of my friends got murdered. I nearly got shot dead and I went to prison twice. So you can imagine as a Nigerian going to prison, not once, but twice, you know, mm -hmm. nearly getting shot dead was actually quite interesting. I was never scared, but I was like, wow, my own friends tried to kill me and six of my friends got murdered. In my heart, I knew that I wasn't really a bad boy. I wasn't really a street guy, but I had no direction. I had no purpose. I didn't really have no positive role models. On the 2nd of November, 2008, I became a born again Christian, gave my life to Christ. My journey started from there, went back to adult college. Um, got my qualifications in counselling, level one of counselling, whatever. I can't remember what I've got anyway, such a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward 2020, I now deliver on different platforms around the world, really teaching people how to develop their leadership distinction. Oh, fantastic. What a great testimony. What was the turning point in your life? You said when you gave your life to Christ, something must have led you to do that. There must have been something. Yeah, so at the time, um, <laughs> my, my cousins were in, in prison for a crime they didn't necessarily commit. So I was living in their house, paying the rent. And then when they came out, they was like, Oni, you didn't do nothing for us. Get out of the house. I was like, huh? So at the time, I was homeless. I was um, in a hotel in Perthfleet for about three or four days. And I was like, oh, I can't do this, man. I, I'm better than this. So, I mean, as a road guy, as a street guy, I used to go to church anyway. So I thought, let me go to my church. Because I, I was just fed up with being fed up. I knew that I can't be living this kind of life, man. I, I'm, I'm not... You know, I'm not some millionaire, but I can't be homeless, man. So I just went to a church and then from then the story changed. Hmm. So how, how old were you, if you don't mind me asking, when you um, uh, sort of like delved into uh, criminal activities? Um, I must have been, how old was I? Uh, university age, 18, 19, 20. I can't remember, about tw maybe 21, 22, I would mm -hmm. say, from that age, okay. yes. And then what age when you turned your life around? About 33, I think, 34, I think, something like that. Wow, that's a long time. Well, thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you so much for that wonderful testimony. We're still coming back to you because some uh, youth might be listening to this and it's like uh, they want to know, oh, what did he do? What is he doing now? So it is actually a great testimony. Thank you for that. So uh, the next person I'm going to call on is that we've heard that. Um, all you said because of the, maybe because of the area that he was living in, one of the contributory factors to what made him go into, uh, to lead a life of crime. And then we heard from um, 
Mr. Logan as well, who gave us the diverse uh, factors. However, I just want to call on the psychiatrist here. She uh, She's actually uh, with the NHS here, and she works with adults with learning uh, disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Um, Tony Magbagbeola. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Tony. Um, what are the factors, apart from those mentioned by Mr. Logan, do you think are the causes of young adults knowingly or knowingly going into crime or falling into crime? I think sometimes it's the um, identity problem um, because a lot of um, black um, minorities or probably Afro-Caribbean, mm. some of them don't actually have an identity. We think they do, but deep inside, and they're caught between two cultures, especially when you have parents who probably grew up in Nigeria and then moved over to the UK and the right. children are actually born here. So right. they tend to pick up cultures here and that can't actually understand the culture the parents are talking to. A classic example is when I, when I grew up in Nigeria, when your parents tell you to do things, you obey and not ask questions. Right. But then when you come to this culture, you can, your parents can talk to you and the perception that you can actually return verbally with your parents and you think it's okay because it's in quotes in their mind the right culture to actually do that. So there's usually initially a culture clash and parents and child not knowing how to actually walk through these two cultures right. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue. Mm -hmm. The other issue is the perpetual media notion of definition of a black young individual right. also plays on the child's mind. I think sometimes we think that children don't understand Mm -hmm. but they do but right. they might not be able to express it the way we do as an adults but they actually absorb all this information and then they're questioning themselves that mm -hmm. why am i in this in this situation why am i different from paul over there who does the same thing but doesn't get chastised for it mm -hmm. and that starts to build the self low self-esteem become low self-confidence, they're thinking there's really nothing out there from, for us. And then sometimes the school system doesn't actually ha help. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, because I'm a mother and I listen to various children talking about life at school, and you might say, oh, there's this thing for black young boys, mm -hmm. that there's also something systemic in the system that mm -hmm. actually chastise black bo young boys in school. And mm -hmm. so once the teacher keeps on telling you you're not good enough, or you cannot achieve something, the child starts to believe that. But mm -hmm. then they cannot go home and tell their parents mm -hmm. that this is the situation because they're thinking, oh, my mother might not believe me. Because when we were growing up at school in Nigeria, if your teacher tells you you're naughty, you dare not go and report to them because then your parents will also deal with you and mm -hmm. also take you back to the teacher. But that doesn't apply here. So mm -hmm. the children feel as though they're in a completely different era that the parents don't understand them, the teachers don't understand them, so they think they need to go somewhere where they think they feel safe. So the children eventually end up in that. And unfortunately, like we know, when you, uh, you either withdraw as a child into yourself or you become an extrovert. And your extrovert leads you to behaviors that you don't necessarily, it's not really you, but you feel is the only way that you can be heard. So it's the communication between mom, teachers, authority, and the child. So right. it's, a three, it's almost like a, a pong regarding to communication. But I had an interesting conversation with my youngest daughter, and she, and she said to me, said, oh, we're Gen Z, the Gen Z. You know, this is the low, the, because we have the Gen Y, the millenniums. But what a lot of parents don't understand is the Gen Z are very emotional creatures. Mm. They're very, very passionate. So when you say things that hurts them badly, they don't keep it. They actually express that passion of what's actually happened. But because of our background, we term it as being rude mm -hmm. or talking back to them, how dare you shout at me? But mm -hmm. you also have to learn how to communicate with this group of people and listen to them because they feel we never listen. And that is another reason why they probably won't talk to you and they might go and talk to somebody else who they think will understand them. Or you find that your children are actually talking to your friends' mothers 
Mm. You know, and you're thinking, how do you know this? And I don't know it. It's mm. because of that bridge of lack of communication, not being able to listen to the child, not because we don't want to, but because as ethnic minority, we tend to work harder than most people. Okay. We have commitment back home. We have commitment here. So mm. the parents are probably juggling with that. And mm. then you have a child who is caught between two cultures. And this whole thing can accumulate in the child being ignored mm -hmm. in their perception. They think they're being ignored mm -hmm. and they go out and then commit crime. Mm -hmm. But also what is so sad about it that sometimes there's also the background of um, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I know it might be something that people might not actually think about. I work in adults with learning disability. And we know in the UK, a lot of people in prison probably have a learning disability. But mm. in our black community, I think sometimes we don't, we're not aware, or sometimes we don't want to acknowledge or we're in denial when yeah. we notice that our child is different from other children. Right. And if we don't acknowledge that, I keep on putting pressure on that child, mm. the child would think you don't love them and then push, you kind of push them out for mm. the society to actually look after. So right. they then present, with things like depression, or they might go out there and take drugs, like um, Mr. Logan has said, to dampen that thing, they can numb that pain, which they already have. And they always uh, subsequently end up either in the psychiatric um, setting or they actually end up in prison. So it's very, very important that as parents, brothers, sisters, we need to start to listen more. Because that's what actually is going to help to build that child and understand where they're coming from. The perception of mom and parents are always right mm -hmm. is no longer viable in this time. We need to take time, sit down with the children, notice what they do. When you have a child who stays indoors, locks their doors and doesn't communicate, find a way to communicate with them. Because there's probably something happening outside mm -hmm. and they're bringing it into the home. But if you don't have that conversation with them, you'll never know what is going on. Mm. So those are the kind of things that could actually happen and they can actually end up in. But what I want to focus really on is think about people who might have a learning disability. We do have them in our community. They're the kind of people who might be walking on the streets. The police might stop them. But because you've trained your child not to talk to strangers, mm. they walk on. Because to them, even if it's a policeman, he's still a stranger to them. Mm. They walk on because they can't understand the concept mm. of why they've been stopped. And mm. there's people like that can actually then get into trouble. But people don't think that, how is he able to communicate? Because their communication with somebody with a learning disability is completely different from people who don't have a learning disability. Mm. So subsequently, because of all this low self-esteem, negative input, and the perception that there's nothing outside for them, Mm -hmm. Most especially, the Black person thinks the only way you can be successful is to either do sports mm -hmm. or go into music and rap. Mm -hmm. But we, have, we need to start to give them views and mentors of people who do other things, yeah. open up their mind, and right. actually encourage them to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Toy. Um, could you tell me, where does the first responsibility of care for young adults lie? The parents. The parents, because I'm always asking these questions and a oh, lot of people oh, come out and oh, say, I say parents or parents, parents or for some the school. Mm. Yeah. yeah, some parents think the school are responsible for the child, but the parents or the carers, because some children are in foster care yeah. or they're adopted. So whoever is the responsible adult is the first part of responsibility. Yeah. The teacher in school cannot instill that. But also you need to be very mindful. I always say to my friends who have children, you need to train them and discipline them and build self-esteem before the age of five. Mm, mm. Before the age of five. Because if you don't do that, when they start school, they yeah. start to engage and listen to things. So you need to set the goal, you need to set the ground firmly so that when they come home, they'll say, oh, such a such a person did that. Mm -hmm. And they will have that conversation with you because they've built that trust with you. Mm. Mm. So in other words, we have the, the issue is multifactorial. So because yes. uh, Mr. Logan talked about a whole lot of factors that uh, constitute this uh, 
um, activities which are young adults engaging, which are rather disheartening. Um, now, my uh, last but not the least panelist here is actually a counselor, psychotherapist, and um, he's an accredited counselor working in private practice with special interest in developmental and relational trauma. He's a member of the British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy. He has been actively working with organizations and implementing initiatives to raise awareness of the causes of mental ill health in the African and Afro-Caribbean communities. Welcome, Kwame Opoku. Good evening. Good evening, Kwame. So you are the counselor that people go to. Um, I have this question for you. As a counselor or psychotherapist, do you get any referral from the police as to why the youth commit uh, some of these crimes? Not in terms of private practice, there's no there's no direct referrals from um, the police service. The police service tends to refer. Leroy can can correct me on this. Um, tends to refer uh, victims through victim support and other statutory services. So quite often there isn't a direct um, referral from from police to therapeutic um, services around. Okay. So when you say victims, could the victims also be part of a gang? Of course. Um, with what Leroy was saying, with what Anya was saying, is, is the fact that quite often we kind of see things as black and white as in victims and perpetrators. Quite mm -hmm. often when, it, when, when we're dealing with, with young people, when we're dealing with youth violence, there often is a cycle of people being victims and perpetrators of, of crime at the same time. Right. And that's part of the vicious cycle um, mm -hmm. and the trauma and the stress of these, of these situations. Because sometimes if you, are, if you become a victim, you might then go out to say, I won't be a victim anymore. So therefore I'm going to be an aggressor. I'm going to be the aggressive one. So, mm -hmm. so, so then you have a cycle of, of people taking revenge attacks, people who are hypervigilant, who are, who are, um, who want to not feel like a victim anymore. So you have, you have this psychology that also is at play. Right. So you mentioned uh, your focus is on developmental and relational trauma. What exactly do you mean by that? So relational trauma is similar to um, the ACEs or childhood trauma, which is um, things that children have gone through, whether it's abuse, different forms of abuse, um, yeah. um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse. Then you also have neglect. You may have uh, trauma in terms of bereavement that hasn't been resolved, um, family separation. Um, and also within the, uh, particularly uh, within the African community, there's also um, the unspoken trauma of separation of families, particularly through migration, where you have, uh, let's say, a father or mother living in Nigeria, one person's living in England, mm -hmm. there isn't a family cohesion. Um, mm -hmm. So all these experiences are necessarily processed and, and sometimes children aren't even made aware that why a father's living back in, back in Nigeria. Right. They might just know that he's, he's traveled, but mm -hmm. they don't have no sense that actually the parents aren't together anymore. So right. there's all these factors at play where it leads to children not having a sense of stability and a sense of, of strong, strong, strong belonging. Mm -hmm. Do you engage in um, group sessions for, you know, during the counseling uh, period? I'm talking about you having the victim and uh, the uh, family members. So do you that's, do it on an individual? No, that's, that's all those types of work are very, very different. So you might have um, um, kind of, restorative justice programs where, where, where a victim and, 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 the, and the family member might, might come together. As, mm -hmm. a, as a therapist, it's very, very different. So let's say someone like Onion would come to me to say, I've been through these experiences. I've experienced uh, friends who have passed away or feeling homeless and it's made me depressed. It's made me anxious mm -hmm. and I need to work through that. So mm -hmm. it's a very interpersonal work. Um, and as some people do family work where you might bring the family together because okay. we can't we can't ignore the fact that children are raised in a in a in a social environment so quite often they need um like, like social social solutions as well right okay thank you very much now let's talk a bit about we've talked about the causes the multifactorial factors uh which uh, contribute to um uh, the reasons why some of our young adults go into crime let's now focus on um the solutions. Let's focus more on what can be done, especially post um, 
COVID-19, when everything seems to go back to normal, as it were. Let me start off with Oi again. Now that you are a speaker, you go everywhere to the prisons, to, um, to the churches and what have you. How effective do you speak? Do you think your speaking engagement is? Well, I think speaking to young people in particular, but now I also speak to families and parents and parents is actually right. quite effective. But one of the things that I do tell young people and parents, parents yeah. alike, the responsibility now lies with them. Yeah. Unfortunately, the moral fabric of this country, most countries around the world are declining every day, every week. So now it's the full responsibility of parents to really now actually um, take, you know, really communicate more with the young people, ask more questions. I mean, some of the advice I give to parents is, you know, you may be working throughout the week, at least one hour a week minimum. Find mm -hmm. time when you and your child or you and your children, no mobile phones, no TV, you're just sitting down to speak. Because right. unfortunately, many in our community, we don't necessarily have that common unity, common unity, community. So mm -hmm. he's in a bedroom, she's in a bedroom, mommy's in the kitchen, daddy's at home, daddy's in a in a bedroom, and then everyone's separated. But right. it's so important now, particularly with social distancing or whatever, that there has to be much more of a community community feel at home. The yeah. streets raise me. I, I've never sat down with my parent or my mom at the time and had a family dinner. I had I only done that with my friends. But now in the 21st century, if young people are only sitting down with their friends and having dinner, imagine some of their friends are bad. So my solution definitely one is them, which I've been telling a lot of parents, is to sit, sit down and find time with your children. When your children, if your children are particularly under the age of 18 and they're, and they're at home with you, it's not, a, it's not like, a, oh, 70% me and 30% them. You're an adult, you're a parent, you have to lay the foundations. The government cannot do it. Social media can't do it. Um, there's only so much the religious institutions can be done. It's now important that as a parent or parents that you lay the, the rules down. Growing up, even though I ended up where I ended up, I had to be in at six o'clock from school. No two ways, no arguing, no debating. Now, mm -hmm. children can be out until eight, nine o'clock and then argue with their parents when they get in. So mm -hmm. now the parents have to retake that responsibility that the government systematically or subconsciously took away from them and mm -hmm. say, hey, this is the ground rules. Let's work together as a family. Let's sit down as one. Um, just before the lockdown, I remember I was taking one of my long walks and mm. I just was walking on the street and I saw a family of, there were Indians mm. and there were the, oh, there's about nine of them sitting around the table eating. Like I was looking, I lo actually looked into the, I was like, wow. But then as I walked along, I saw like a community of young, you know, young black boys all standing out eating chicken chips on the road. And I was like, wow, there's, there's the difference. There's the difference. So it's so important now, a solution now is, Parents have to find time. I know many are busy, many are working, many are maybe going through what they're going through, but they have to find time and mm -hmm. sit down and communicate with their children. We know children usually nine times out of 10 have one word answer. How are you doing? I'm fine. How was mm -hmm. school? I'm fine. But that's the parent's opportunity now as a coach to deliver and develop their coaching skills and begin mm -hmm. to ask questions. Why, if not, the mm -hmm. streets or society, social media, or whoever will now begin to control the mindsets of a generation. And we saw if my generation, the streets yeah. controlled us and it, and it was war, it was gang warfare on an unprecedented level. So I believe a solution now definitely is parents have to not only take responsibility, mm -hmm. but take control and say, as long as this is my house in my, my thing, let's work together, let's speak together, let's communicate more. For me, that's one of the ways to, to solve this. Fantastic, because I mean, coming from you, because a lot of people usually say that um, uh, they have to work, they have to work. Yes, they do have to, but they've forgotten that they've got children to raise as well. And another yes. thing I want to um, actually um, let people know, a lot of people always blame lone parent families that, oh, it's because the uh, father wasn't there. Oh, it's because the mother wasn't there. Oh, it's because, oh, that child was raised by the mother. Would you subscribe to that, that? That's it in all cases. Um, like, speaking from my own experience, and um, people always ask me, oh, do you think if your dad was with you, yeah. um, you wouldn't have gone what through you've gone through? I, th yeah. I believe every young man or every young child needs a father figure. Right. Um, salute our single mothers. They do dramatically well, honestly. Right. But it's interesting when uh, 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 young men in particular or young people, our role models are more masculine men who are yeah. authoritative, who are dynamic, who may be char charismatic. So that's yeah. saying something. We, we, our role models are not weak-wheeled, you know, jelly, jelly back men. That we, we want strong, strong men. And if the strong men are not there, there's mm. only so much 
a single mother could do. And I'm not taking away from what single mothers have done because mm. some of them are strong. My mom's the best mom in the world. Look how she raised me. But yeah. I made my de- my decisions. But yeah. I, I believe definitely a father figure makes a, a big, big, big difference. Yeah. I subscribe to that. I subscribe to that too, that, if, you know, if a father figure makes a big difference. But then again, there's so many people that I know, including myself, who raise children by themselves. And the children are on the straight and narrow. So I suppose it's an individual thing. But yes, I do take your point because at times I do feel for lone parent uh, families, especially the lady saying, oh, it's because there's no man in your life. That's why the uh, children are running them up. No, not in all cases. There's some women, strong women, they go to work and they've raised good children as well. So um, we'll keep on talking. But thank you so much for your contribution there. I would like to bring back uh, Miss Logan here. What do you think are the mechanisms we should have in place to curb the youth crimes, especially post-COVID-19? Well, I think there definitely needs a proper assessment of the scale of the problem. Uh, mm-hmm. And that relies heavily on how the statutory services um, are have the capacity to do that work because um, not only policing, but in, in healthcare, whether it's mental or not, um, social care and local authorities, right. there's been a significant um, reduction in uh, finances. And of course, we all know how much money the government's been throwing out there mm-hmm. to, to support businesses, small, medium and large, but you know, and, and helping local authorities. But at some stage, that, that money has to be clawed back. And it's going. To, we may go back into another austerity. And we've already known the impact of the austerity over the last 10 years wow. in um, really having drastic cuts in assets, policing and, and right across the board. So, but, to, you know, we, we cannot allow... Uh, assumptions to be made about the the scale of the problem Um, but a key part of that is to um, have that greater connection so I think uh, policing and other statutory agencies have to be very proactive Mm -hmm. how they work with identifying the 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 risk areas the the -hmm. families who are at risk of being um, not only having problems in the home because as I said in, in my input initially, right. if you can really assess the home and where the risk factors, you can I, sh- deal with it more as a care problem than an enforcement problem, um, mainly through the public health approach. Mm-hmm. And as I said, identifying the ACEs and, you know, and, and the more sophisticated you are in, in your um, intelligence gathering mm-hmm. and uh, assessment process, you're able to pick up, is it an identity issue? Is it a mental health issue? And so there's less assumptions and less stereotypes. I think also it, it, it prevents having any sort of um, racializing of your strategy because we have um, so many instances of where um, individuals are, are missed because of certain uh, assumptions made and stereotypes and as I said about exclusions I, I mean a, a, a case in point um, I, I, I can't mention the name but the, I, I've been doing gang intervention work um, mm-hmm. here in East London and the the issue of the the young person being excluded and then not being picked up because once they're excluded they actually um, the responsibility to the local authority. Well, as I said, local authority have had massive assets stripped. So as a result of that, uh, they get they fall through the gaps. And, and one um, young man, in fact, um, I won't mention his name. It was in the lo- uh, in the national newspapers because uh, uh, they did a, a massive case conference review on it, and the report came out only a couple of weeks ago. It was Jaden Moody, and, and, and it's quite clear. They, they didn't have a full assessment of the family and, you know, with, if it's dysfunctional or not. And he had been moved around and one local authority wasn't speaking to the other. All the different agencies were not joined up and the, the, the multi-agency um, partnerships um, have different names. Some call it MASH, et cetera. 
those partnerships weren't actually fit for purpose. And I think a lot of it is because they saw, um, they didn't recognize, acknowledge the severity of the risk that young man was under. Yes. And I think, and I, and I look at it this way, mm. and it might answer some of your question, is the scale of, of, of the murders and the stabbings and the shootings. Right. You wonder if it was white youngsters shooting and stabbing themselves on this scale, would it be left for so many years? Because I've been looking at knife crime and gun crime since the late 90s right. and how street crime proliferated through crack distribution and mainly young black youngsters, not necessarily involved in gangs at the time, but man them on road were involved in that. And um, they were sucked in on that. And that still goes on today. Now, I think that, and that I talked about county lines. Again, mm -hmm. what is the scale of the risk? And, and making sure that if it's the gangs matrix, making sure you, you don't allow, um, you know, assumptions to criminalize people unnecessarily. Because once you criminalize them, they're in the hands of the, of the gangs, you know? So it's a question of doing proper assessment and, and, and prevent casualties like your Jason Moody's mm -hmm. who drop out the system. And I, I think in a lot of ways, once they treat young people of African, Caribbean, Asian origins, the same as their white mm -hmm. counterparts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and treat them with respect and dignity, then I think we'll get a massive improvement um, and making sure that the assets go to the right um, people who are at most at risk and with those early intervention and prevention programs. Because just in closing, prevention, I believe, is the key. There used to be a lot more proactivity on having working with grassroots organizations as well as statutory agencies to make sure you had a comprehensive approach to prevention programs. That's almost non-existent. So there tends to be a firefighting type response going, you know, um, police are reacting from one stabbing or shooting or, or, or acid attack from another. Um, and, and all the other agencies are doing likewise. So they've got to build back capacity for early um, prevention work, relevant and real intervention work. Mm -hmm and making sure it's sustainable. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll see what priority they place on it. I'm not gonna be um, kicking my heels uh, with joy yet because I know how they dealt with it as a lower priority over the last 20 years. And I, I, don't, I don't see that changing. I, I'm sorry to be skeptical, but being realistic. Exactly. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Logan. Um, can I bring back um, ACP uh, Agbonica? Um, you have been involved in several police reform efforts, which include youth and school outreach programs. What do you think um, the, the kind of programs that you can have in place? This is to um, ACP Agbonica. What do you think uh, programs can be in place in order to prevent uh, the young adults from going back into crime or for, you know, uh, to prevent them from uh, falling into crime. ACP Agbonica, are you still there? You mentioned that you've been involved in a lot of reforms. So what do you think post COVID-19? Uh, briefly tell us, what do you think that um, can be done to prevent uh, these young adults from uh, continuing with their criminal activities, how can we engage them? Yeah, thank you. I, I've actually um, had occasion to engage the youths in uh, different areas, uh, trying to be proactive. Yeah. I, you discover that uh, the causes of <laughs> youths engaging in crime yeah. is most times outside the police. So uh, instead of, uh, it's good to be, it's not like, okay, it's good, it's good to find out the causes if you have a particular problem and depending on where you are, it's good to find out the causes. There, I've had a lot of initiatives that helped in the past. Okay. One, I've had um, uh, situations like engaging them in some diversionary, um, uh, you know, like sports, right. um, arts, music, uh, that they find, even though it's time consuming, you have to, 
you have to collaborate with a lot of other agencies get yeah. and to get these things done yeah. because there is no uh, the, the system does not have anything inbuilt for that unlike what i noticed um the last time i was in, in new york in 2018 i noticed that they had this power that is police athletic league which yeah. was uh, very good and it helped with children uh, and youths of different mm -hmm. stages and they find that they it, it, you know that one has uh, is an initiative that has been existing and it's something that has accepted over the years but yeah. right here i find that as a police commander of a particular unit yeah. you have to come up with initiatives depending on the problems i'll give you an example mm -hmm. there was a, a situation in lagos island where i discovered that like I was discussing, I discovered that the problem of the youths there was more environmental. It was connected with the environment they found themselves. Right. Because there was no space for them for relaxation and whatever. So I find that it affected them uh, psychologically and um, it also affected the area boy uh, syndrome that they had there, the street uh, life syndrome and the autism that the youths were involved in. So I came up with an initiative with some agencies and uh, what I called Unite yeah. was just to take the youth out. We, we used to meet once in a while, we do some yoga, some kind of exercises, sports, and then move them sometimes to recreational facilities, to conservation centers where they have an impact with, with, um, with um, you know, with nature. Yeah. And I discovered it was helping and it became a thing uh, for the youths to do. You know, they were talking among themselves, ah, you do belong to Unite and so on. And, you know, initiatives like that can come up. There's no hard and fast way of going about it. But I think generally uh, what we should be thinking about is an all conclusive, inclusive uh, system of handling it, a kind of collaborative system whereby the government will be brought in on um, civil society organizations the police, a kind of community-oriented policing system, whereby you find all the agencies, uh, the um, experts, the psychosocial experts, and the government should also think about uh, facilities that we don't have, like, uh, for instance, social support, welfare, and um, uh, sometimes you find unemployment, alone could just be the causes. These youths are not employed, and this is not what the police can handle on their own. Exactly. So but if there's a way we can have an all-conclusive, yeah, I mean, a kind of collaborative effort where all these important stakeholders come together and we're able to bring the government, parents, mm -hmm. schools, community leaders, mm -hmm. and we all look at the causes of this and every uh, stakeholder takes part of his own uh, uh, area, you'll find that we'll be able to uh, engage our youths. Uh, okay. Uh, meaning, okay. Them out of right. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to bring back to two. Um, do you have a system, um, you know, instead of uh, prosecutions all the time, do you have something similar to a shock treatment whereby you take the youths on a tour of prison or you say, look, this is what's going to happen to you and you get an inmate to talk to them because there are times community service is not a deterrent. So even though I know it depends on the gravity of the crime. So would you say that things like giving them shock treatment as in going to the prisons might help instead of you just uh, uh, prosecuting them? What do you think? Well, what well, first and first is, is that we have to have it in mind that um, apart from, apart from um, uh, prosecution, there are other options. Yes. But like I earlier said, those options apply to a minor or child. Like for instance, a, 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 a university undergraduate that is over age 18. Mm -hmm. If he or she commits an offense, has to go to the regular courts. Right. So now that's what the law says. Mm -hmm. Well, to a certain extent, if before the matter gets to court, if that offender is ready to plea bargain, right, he has that option. 
it could plea bargain. And under the plea bargain um, facility, it, 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 might be, it, it might be considered and just maybe send him to, for now, community service or whatever, but he still has to be sanctioned right. for his offense. Right. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Kwame, do you have any recommendations as to the way forward? Okay. You engage with these youths uh, for counseling. Do you find them reoffending or what's the success rate for your counseling session? It's, it's if you if you can break through to them, then then it is it, it does really really well. The main thing is like it's a personal issue, but it's also a family issue. It's a community issue. So, in as everyone has been alluding to, it requires a holistic approach. And as a therapy and therapy psychological services are only one part of it, because if you work with the individual, but the environment is still very stressful, still very toxic, mm -hmm. then it, it's still it's still gonna be, it's still gonna be very, very difficult to break a cycle. So. It's, it does require a, 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 a holistic approach. And um, if that happens, then it's, it's very, very good results. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Okay. Tony, as a parent, in order to effectively tackle youth crime, what other approaches do you think we as parents need to adopt? You know, what are the signs we should be looking out for in our children or our young adults? Tony. Okay, I think the most important thing, like I mentioned, is actually communication. Mm -hmm. And also what I think is, as a parent, you should know your child. I know sometimes people say, oh, I know my child. Right. But I think it's very important to actually communicate with them. Usually when they're between the primary school age, you kind of know what they do. But mm -hmm. when they get into secondary, okay. like, you know, when the hormones between and they're going through puberty, parents need to be aware that sometimes the hormonal part of it could be part of what the problem is, but being able to talk to them. I said, the more you listen, especially when they're in secondary school, the more you actually get at the child. Because I know sometimes you have this cultural belief that, oh, I'm not your friend, I'm your mother or I'm your father. Right. But you know, in this day and age, you need to be their friend so that they can actually come to you when there's something going around, they're able to right. communicate with you and they feel comfortable talking about things that you don't normally talk about. And also there's certain signs when they become withdrawn or right. they're staying out late. You need to work out for things like maybe smell them when they come in. You don't have, it, has to be, it doesn't have to be overt. Right. And just sniff through, you know, or you notice things in the house that is normally not in the house or they have things on them. There's not actually something that you purchase or somebody you know gave to them. So little, little things like that can be, you know, and start to do lots of things. Right. I think when we grow up, we need to do lots of things. But, we need that interaction and actually getting them engaged so when they go out. And even if things are about, they know that home is peaceful, home is where they can actually have that conversation and right. get over things. And don't keep things in the mind. Right. You notice that they're feeling down, just hit on it. They might say, no, 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 there's nothing wrong. Right. But as a mother, especially, you've got that instinct. I know there's something wrong. They probably might not be ready to talk about it, but you gradually try to engage with them until right. you're able to keep things out. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I have a question here for um, ACP Agbonica, and it's, uh, it's uh, boarding schools in Nigeria have become breeding grounds for criminals. Do you think our wow. schools are doing enough? ACP Agbonica, can you hear me? Hey. Yes, I can hear you. Do you think the schools are doing enough in Nigeria? No, I don't. Okay. I don't think they're doing enough, uh, but it depends on the uh, class of schools. I've always advocated that they should allow the police or a kind of security uh, system in the universities. Those right. days, when we were going to school, we had uh, uh, police who would come into the universities and uh, interact with the students. But these days, the, after the problem they had sometimes in the 70s, they said that police officers cannot go into universities unless they are invited by the vice chancellor of the university. Mm -hmm. I've always said this is a contributed to uh, crime. Not like if we get into the university, we will not be chasing students around and trying to make arrests, but just our presence there, you know, and the fact that we are getting friendly and they know 
they are, when they are doing whatever they're doing, they, they, we have some kind of, of uh, uh, security agency or some kind of law enforcement, and uh, uh, it helps to enforce discipline of the school itself. Right. Then in secondary schools, uh, we've all said um, a lot about parents, the role of the parents and all these things. There's really uh, a lot to do. Not all schools, not all students are in boarding, uh, uh, boarding schools. Some go to schools from their homes. And so you find that if we have this uh, joint, this collaborative efforts, uh, a whole uh, uh, approach, it, might, it will help a great deal. Okay. To the program. Thank you very much for that. I think there was a question here for Oyin. Uh, well, I think it's exactly what you've just said, though. Uh, ACP Agbonica, that what approach do you suggest for the government in Nigeria to ensure proper youth development? And I think it also goes back to what Mr. Logan actually said as well. So when we're talking about resources, there has to be a lot of resources going into different programs because I listen to a lot of uh, uh, people speaking, you know, inspirational speakers, uh, you know, different people speaking on various things, how to curb crime. But I think we should now move away from the talk shop. What are we doing? What are the effective programs in order to uh, minimize um, the crime rate, especially amongst the youths. So now we've noticed that maybe there is a decrease due to the pandemic. However, some people are probably still engaged in selling, you know, in selling drugs and what have you. So when the whole restriction is lifted, uh, we're just hoping that uh, we wouldn't go back to the way we were. Now, I asked Dr. Tony the other time that uh, what should we be looking for? I, as a parent, I believe one of the things is to keep on looking at your, you know, not only communicating with your young adults, but actually if they still live under your roof. I, I have this, um, I, I have this mantra under my roof, you obey my rules. But at the same time, you need to watch it. If they're earning, say, for example, uh, 200 pounds a week and they're bringing in, um, you know, sneakers worth about 500 pounds and you know you haven't given them the money that's another way of actually keeping a tab on your young adults in the house you know so we shouldn't disregard the notion that the first responsibility of care of ensuring that they don't fall into crime lies with the parents or whoever is looking after the young adults be it a, a foster carer or um you know your adoptive parents Whoever is responsible for that young adult should actually be uh, watching out for them to ensure, okay, if they're going somewhere, try as much as possible to find out. And yes, I think somebody mentioned bullying. I think it was ACP Agbonica. There are times some children are being bullied. And uh, I mean, some people always say that the bully actually, uh, uh, in a way, some of them now turn into, a, you know, bullies themselves. So if you think that the uh, person is a bit withdrawn, I think that's when you need to communicate more instead of just leaving them to it. So I think it's so important that we should all be responsible. It's not the fault of the government or the fault of the parents or the teachers or whoever. It has to be inclusive. It is our responsibility responsibility. So um, I'd just like to take one or two more questions before we round up. Um, I think uh, we've managed to uh, address all the questions that's been posted in the chat box here. Um, maybe this one can go back to uh, ACP Agoni. Somebody asked the question here, what can be done to curb the area boys, which maybe over here we'll probably call them social miscreants or, you know, um, maybe street gangs, I don't know, who have been a menace to the society for a very long time. What do you think we can do about that? You see them at motor parks uh, all over the place. Yes, um, one of the... Uh, one basic thing that I would suggest is to create jobs for them. Right. And some of them are not very employ are not really employable because they, of their standard of education. That, that means we need to give them some kind of basic education or we need to give them some skill acquisition training. And right. after that, we need to ensure that they have shelter. Some of them don't have shelter, they sleep on the streets. Right. Then uh, after that, we need to ensure 
they get a good employment. But I, for, with the experience I had working with area boys, yeah. I discovered that a typical area boy, for instance, on Lagos Island, earns about 5,000 uh, a day. Mm-hmm. In a month, that's in, in, in a month, he earns about 150,000 naira. That is on a bad day, he right. gets not less than 5,000 naira. Now, there was a time that the government in Lagos State tried to give them jobs. And how much can the government possibly pay them? Not much. Can't, the government can't pay them more than 5,000 naira. And this is someone who is in a month. And this is someone who is uh, on a bad day who gets 5,000 naira. So they are used to it. They are not interested in that government job and so on. So that is where other um, stakeholders need to come in. You need to uh, get other stakeholders to uh, uh, talk to them to kind of um, do some reorientation you right. know, for them to understand that the other life they are living, it, uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, going to pay, pay off at the end of the day and so on. And then, of course, whenever they are engaged in, uh, in a crime and they are arrested, it, it doesn't matter whether they are uh, political talks that are, are well favored or whatever, we should ensure that anybody who uh, breaks who fell far of the law should be right. prosecuted accordingly. And if they see that crime is not paying, they are going to prison for committing crime, or they are going to correctional institution for, for committing crime, it will definitely dissuade them from engaging in those uh, era boys activities that okay. they engage in. All right. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Kwame, you have a comment to make. And just want to follow up something that you were saying as well. And I think it's really important for us to, to say that a lot of parenting is not, is not natural to, to a lot of people. Good parenting skills is not, is not innate for, for, for everybody. So a lot of parents need to step up their parenting skills game. Um, mm-hmm. And that could be through courses, that could be through reading, that could be through um, watching and listening to other people but we have to stop thinking that African parents are good parents just because they're born that way. We, we, we all have work to do and we have to nurture our, our relationships with, with, with our children and with our families. And in terms of how we're preparing our African children for the lives of society, that's another question that we, has, been, has been touched upon here, but it's a massive issue in terms of how are we preparing our young people to face the challenges of the world around them? whether it's the school system, university system, employment, criminal justice system. So there's also a lot, a, a lot, a lot of gaps that we within the community really need to plug as well. That's a fair comment because uh, with RAM, that's why we call it renewing the African mindset because as African parents, uh, once they're in advanced nations, we still import all the culture and everything, forgetting the environment as well. And that these children you know, or the young adults are born in an advanced nation. So at times they struggle with both cultures. And I'm, we're, we're saying on, in Ram here that what take what's good in the African culture, what's good in the um, Western culture and try to uh, sort of like uh, infuse the two without losing your African heritage, which I think is very important. So at the same time, African parents need to know that it's a totally different environment. Our mindsets need to actually change, you know, in accordance with our location as well, because uh, a lot of people just bring in all their ideas and they expect their young adults to understand. Uh, so it's quite important. I think one last comment here from uh, Theo Ojulami. Uh, maybe you want to unmute yourself and uh, tell us. You said there should be new neighborhood initiative the African way. If you could explain that to us, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Theo Ojulami and um, I'm pleased to be here with you all. Um, apologies for turning up a bit late. Um, this is an interesting group, and I'm pleased to be part of this group today. Um, yeah, um, what I meant by um, the subject, which is actually uh, to do with uh, new neighborhood initiative, the African way. Right. Because I know, I'm not saying we should start beating people up or beating these kids up. But we should take interest in our children. Every child out there that's African, uh, every one of us should make an effort to have 
actually take interest in. Um, not that we interfere in their personal relationships, but we should take interest. That's what I meant by that. Uh, the, the other thing Hello, is, sorry, ma'am. Yeah, are you still there? Okay, and I go on. Okay, all right. Um, safeguarding, I, I was also thinking in terms of um, creative systems as well. Because, um, yeah, we can do all the talking until we start putting some kind of framework together. It becomes just talking, basically. And I believe that um, it's about time we start trying to look into putting some systems in place. Um, in terms of the prison services, uh, in people, in homes as well, Um, somebody made a comment here that uh, I live in Essex and the consensus is that this region is about five years behind London in terms of prevalence of youth crime. This means we have the opportunity to prevent South, sorry, to prevent youth crime from escalating to the level it's at in London. Can any of the speakers recommend some good practical preventative measures we can put in place? as a community to help safeguard our young people from getting into the crime. 